So, buenos dias. That's about all the Spanish that I know, so that's pretty much all you're going to get. Um, I also apologize if I sniffle or I sneeze at all. I've actually somehow gotten sick since I've been here in Valencia, so my apologies for that. Um, my name is Victoria Heath. I'm the Digital Communications Officer at the University of Toronto at a research center called the Institute for Gender and the Economy. I also have a sort of um, side hustle, I guess you could say, that I do a lot of digital storytelling and research projects for a variety of organizations, predominantly in the education or international affairs space. So today I'm going to be talking about the uses and abuses of storytelling. And this topic um, was actually inspired by a really great book that I read recently called The Uses and Abuses of History, and it's written by this very world-renowned Canadian historian and professor who's at the University of Oxford, and her name is Margaret Macmillan. And she wrote in her book, we can learn from history, but we can also deceive ourselves when we selectively take evidence from the past to justify what we have already made up our minds to do. And honestly, I worry sometimes that in my work, um, I do this, and because when I'm essentially trying to tell a story using statistics or facts or academic research and theories or insights, often I have to simplify really nuanced topics, and I worry that I'm slightly biased in what I select to include within my stories. So that's why I sort of decided to talk about this topic today and was inspired by this really great book because I want to become a more responsible storyteller and I want to share the things that I've kind of learned with you as well. So it's 2014 and I'm just out of university teaching at a middle school in Newark, New Jersey. If you don't know where Newark is, it's about 20 minutes away from downtown New York City. And I'm standing in a packed classroom with over 25, 12 and 13 year olds, which is terrifying. And I'm supposed to be teaching them about global affairs, and um, more specifically, about this guy. He's the supreme leader of North Korea, Kim Jong-un. And a few months earlier, he had actually um, shook the world by launching missiles and um, a nuclear detonation. So he's in the news, and my students have no idea who he is, and they have no idea where even North Korea is. So I'm trying to teach them. And I'm failing really badly. My students are literally falling asleep in class. So I decided to call the one person in my life that always seems to have the answer to all of my problems, and that's my grandmother. And she tells me in her wonderfully Southern American accent that I will not try to mimic today, that of course they're bored because I have to find what interests them. I have to somehow relate this topic that I'm trying to teach them to what they know. So in a last ditch effort, I do what pretty much almost every desperate teacher does. I turn to YouTube. And I realized that um, mo most of my students are interested in one or of two sports. They're either interested in basketball or they're interested in soccer, otherwise, no otherwise known as football here. And so I decide to type in North Korea sports into YouTube and see what comes up and hope that I find something that will catch their attention. And in fact, I did. And this beauty popped up. This week on Vice, we go to North Korea. I won't show the whole documentary, but it's really incredible. It's a Vice documentary that follows the Harlem Globetrotters, which are um, an exhibition basketball team from New York City. And they go on a trip, actually, to North Korea, because apparently Kim Jong-un loves basketball. So I decided to show this documentary to my class to try to get them interested in North Korea. And it was magical. It worked so well. I had never seen a class of 12 and 13 year olds be so engaged and so quiet. So of course I had to call my grandmother and say thank you very much for doing that for me. Um, and I love Brad Pitt so I just wanted to put him in here. <laughs> so that was really the first time that I personally realized the power of really good storytelling, especially in education. And it worked so well because my students could, in a few ways, identify with the Harlem Globetrotters and also with basketball. It was something that they knew. And it related to something that they could empathize with as well. And that experience really led me to sort of where I am today, um, doing digital storytelling products as, an, as a means of knowledge mobilization and translation for different education activities and activism. So this is some of the work that I've done. You can go on my website, which is down there at the bottom highlighted in yellow to see a bit more. Um, 
And then here's a video, I'm just going to show a bit of it that I did very recently with an organization that I'm a part of called Women in International Security Canada. Why does NATO matter? <clears throat> Damn. Here's an old story that you may have heard before. In 1932, on the eve of Hitler's rise to power, Einstein asked Freud, why war? Freud replied, because man is what he is. War remains an unwelcome constant of the human experience. It has occurred since the beginning of known history and continues today. Despite this, we do try to prevent it. After the utter devastation of World War II, in response to the growing threat of militarism and Soviet expansion in Europe, NATO, one of the world's oldest international military alliances, came into existence. Men with courage and vision can still determine their own destiny. So I won't show too much of it, but that's just an example of the type of storytelling that I like to do, which is sort of taking um, narrative and uh, historical footage or historical facts and kind of weaving them in with also interviews um, for education. So in my current full-time role, so not my side hustle, um, at the Institute for Gender and the Economy, I've really tried to put storytelling to good use in order to change the conversation on gender um, equality. And this is part of our mission. So you can see some of the topics that we've worked on here. Um, so from bias and stereotypes to masculinity and quotas. And you can go to the website, which is also highlighted in ye yellow there at the bottom, to see some more of the work that we've been doing. So I'm sure, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to show just an example of some of the work that I've been doing at the Institute as well, using storytelling to try to make academics seem more like human beings and like people. I think a lot of people feel like academics can be very robotic and very up in their ivory towers a lot of times and they don't really engage with communities outside of academia. So um, we created this series called Meet a Fellow, which introduces some of our academic fellows to a wider audience um, through video. So I'll just show a short bit of this as well. And this is, I'm um, sorry, this is one of our uh, professors, Dion Poehler, and she's talking about the gender wage gap. I think one of the things that really gets missed in conversations around the gender wage gap um, is the fact that many women are not in the traditional labor market. It actually uh, has a somewhat unintended consequence of devaluing the work that women do in the home and devaluing what we perceive right now still as predominantly women's work. So I'm working right now with GATE on a project that's investigating the sources of the gender wage gap. A lot of research that has come out recently in Scandinavia and in other areas around the world has focused a lot on the effect of the motherhood penalty. The gender wage gap starts to increase a lot after the birth of the first child. And so one of the things that we are interested in looking at is how women change their the firms they're working for, the organizations they're working for, or how they actually change sectors or even uh, occupations altogether after the birth of a first child, when they do that um, and where they move, and whether those organizations that they move to have different kinds of uh, family-friendly practices or work-family balance practices that allow them to be able to balance the demands of work and family. Um, and one of the challenges associated with all of the policy around these areas is that we often don't think about people who are actually always excluded from the traditional labor market or who for a variety of reasons because of child care or elder care responsibilities or because they volunteer um, extensively in the community. Most of these kinds of roles generally do fall to women as well. So some of these policy interventions focus predominantly on the labor market can exclude a large proportion of women who aren't actually in the traditional labor market and may not be. So another policy option that I've been thinking a lot about and doing some research on is a basic income guarantee. And a basic income guarantee is, is one way of addressing things like poverty, um, income security for Canadians that might lose their jobs due to automation or uh, because they're between jobs. Um, unemployment insurance has been a way that we've addressed this in the past. 
But a basic income can also provide compensation for people who are doing really socially valuable activities in society that we don't want people to stop doing, um, but can provide them some compensation for those activities. Actually, though, it doesn't really fit with what I said, Brian. This is why I have too many areas of research. <laughs> I have like, no idea how to bring it together. That's we'll see fine. if we can figure it out. <laughs> we'll figure it out. So I always try to end those clips that we have of each of our fellows with um, kind of an outtake of them because I find that that really not only loosens them up while we're talking, but it also shows the audience that, you know, they're people too and they make mistakes. Um, so that's one of the reasons I try to make it more of a human experience through those videos. So I'm sure many of you already know that storytelling obviously matters, especially in the diversity and inclusion space. However, I did want to outline just some things that I think are really important that we remember of why storytelling is so, so important to um, creating more gender equality or equality in general or increasing diversity and inclusion. And the first is scale. Um, with storytelling, we're able to take some of these really intense theories and research and facts and data and reach a wider audience. Um, because storytelling can translate those things in such a great and amazing way that people who aren't really in the space can understand what we're talking about. And that feeds into the next one, which is we can break through the noise. People are so inundated with content and with issues and with facts and yada, 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 that we're, we get you know bored, like I get bored hearing myself talk. So storytelling is a great way for us to be able to break through the noise of everything that's on the internet and everything that people are getting by... Um, kind of evoking empathy and getting that human experience across. And then the other one is humans versus systems. You know, we're talking about issues that are like institutional bias, um, systemic discrimination, but it's the human stories that are within these really massive problems that are so important to get people to care and to get people to act and in the end to actually change these systems that we're fighting against. And then the last one is um, empathy equals action. I don't know if you've heard of the uh, science journalist Daniel Goldman, who actually wrote and coined the term emotional intelligence, but he wrote in his book that a tendency to act is implicit in every emotion. So if we're able to get people, to kind of get to people's emotions and get their empathy going, we're more likely to get them to act. And storytelling is such a powerful tool to get people to feel empathy and feel emotions and therefore to get them to act. So today I'm going to go over just really briefly, six examples of the uses and abuses of storytelling. I'm not going to tell you which ones I think are abuses. I want you to sort of figure that out on your own. Um, but each one kind of fits in these very loose categories that I've outlined here. And the first is the use of storytelling for political history and for commentary. And I'm sure many people have heard this before. I won't try to even pronounce the French translation of Let Them Eat Cake. But this is something that is attributed to the French queen Marie Antoinette as her response when a courtier told her that her French people had no bread and were starving on the eve of the French Revolution. It's a terrible response, right? That's a terrible person. Who would ever say that? But the fact is that she never did say it. And even before it was attributed to her, it was actually attributed to other queens and other princesses. So this is probably one of the earliest and most well-known examples of, I would say, fake news um, that we have in political history. But the story really caught on and this attribution was actually a part of a massive campaign to smear the queen alongside other cartoons that, were, that tried to portray her as sexually promiscuous and manip manipulative. And there's an academic who wrote a really interesting paper, and she said that the queen became a symbol for all women in the public sphere, and as the fear of gender lines and roles blurring increased, her vilification served to both voice those fears and attempt to reassert the proper place for women. So she kind of became the symbol that people were trying to counter what was going on at the time in terms of gender roles changing and what she meant to that. And it's really interesting because what happened to Marie Antoinette um, is still happening today. The same techniques that were used against her, like visuals, outrageous hot takes, and fake news is really indicative of what's been used against other well-known women today, um, Hillary, Clinton probably, Hillary Clinton probably being the most well-known. So although she was probably one of the first victims to this, she definitely wasn't the last. And then the second um, 
is propaganda. So I don't know how many people in Spain would know this poster, but this is a poster of um, uh, Rosie the Riveter, and it usually has like "We Can Do It" on the poster. And this was um, actually a product of U.S. propaganda. And as one academic noted, in World War II, the government used this type of propaganda to communicate the need for changes in women's roles for the duration of the war. And these campaigns were necessary in order to change public attitudes about women's roles left over from the previous de decade. Unfortunately, after the war, propaganda was again used, not only by the government, but also by companies to push women back into the home. So we were pulled out of the home and then we were pushed back into the home. So that's also something else very interesting to look at. Before the war effort to succeed at the time, this type of propaganda was absolutely necessary. And it worked. So many women entered the workforce in massive, massive numbers. And propaganda at the time took many different forms. As you can see, the posters to the left and to the right. But video was also used heavily. And in fact, a lot of famous Hollywood uh, producers and filmmakers were actually recruited by the government to create propaganda pieces and to actually document the war. There's this amazing documentary on Netflix in North America, so I'm not sure if it's on Netflix here, but it's called Five Came Back, and it actually follows these five uh, directors, like John Ford, who was very, very famous at the time, and their experience during the war and kind of what they took away from it and what their idea about the war was, and if they actually agreed with the government using them to, to do this work. So the government spent money on this and time because they knew they had to win not only the physical war, but the ideological and the messaging war as well. And what better way to do that than through storytelling? And this is actually something that the government, especially the United States government, still uses today to try to counter extremist ideologies. The next one is edutainment. Um, I don't know if a lot of people know this term here, but edutainment is essentially education entertainment. And it's been really useful in encouraging behavior change. As um, someone at the World Bank said, entertainment education or edutainment can be a game changer for development. Unlike traditional behavior change campaigns that convey abstract concepts and become really repetitive very, very quickly, educational narratives are easier to follow and remember than abstract information. And there's a really interesting study that followed um, a media campaign that was attended by over 16,000 Ugandans in 112 villages. And these, this media campaign was essentially dramatizations of um, anti-violence against women messages that mirrored really popular soap operas. So they made these dramatizations in the form of soap operas. And they actually found that although similar types of propaganda don't necessarily change attitudes, they change people's behavior. And the reason for that is communal exposure to anti-violence against women messages in this way through this sort of cinematic display um, actually changes descriptive norms. And it, because it's showing a more sympathetic community, they show what a community should do to counter violence against women. And in turn, they saw the communities that they showed this to actually then following the norms that they saw on TV. There are many other examples of edutainment. Sesame Street is a big one in the United States. I don't know, do you have Sesame Street here? You do, okay. What's it, what is it in Spanish? Oh, cool. <laughs> it sounds better in Spanish. <laughs> um, so there are other companies that also do this. The Discovery Channel is one. How Stuff Works is one of my favorites because they basically explain everything. Um, and then there's this really amazing or organization called Film Aid, which works in a lot of developing economies, and they've done a lot of work on HIV and AIDS. The next one is corporate social activism. Um, so in the world of diversity and inclusion, we've seen a lot of co corporate social activism via advertising campaigns. And um, a lot of this has been coined femvertising. And I actually really agree with this one critique about femvertising, which is rather than being a genuine advocate for social change, which is obviously the goal of feminism, Dove's ads invents a post-feminist sensibility aligned closely with consumerism. So women are supposedly becoming empowered when they buy one of Dove's products. So it therefore, it's, it's tied, the buying of this product is therefore tied to women's individual gains. So it's really hard for corporate social activism to divorce itself from consumerism and from, hey, you need to buy this product in order to make a better world. And of course, there are a lot of organizations that do this 
always um, had a really interesting campaign of hashtag like a girl. And then I don't know how big of a deal this was in Spain, but in the US and in Canada, Nike's ad that featured Colin Kaepernick, who was the ex-football player who took a knee during the national anthem and drew the ire of a lot of conservatives in the United States, including the president of the United States. They did an ad with him that um, really, really was very, very controversial. And I actually want to show the ad because I think a lot of people have heard about the ad and they've heard that it was controversial, but they never actually saw it. So I think it's an important thing to show of an example of how corporate social activism sort of manifests itself today. If people say your dreams are crazy, if they laugh at what you think you can do, good. Stay that way. Because what non-believers fail to understand is that calling a dream crazy is not an insult. It's a compliment. Don't try to be the fastest runner in your school or the fastest in the world. Be the fastest ever. Don't picture yourself wearing OBJ's jersey. Picture OBJ wearing yours. Don't settle for homecoming queen or linebacker. Do both. Lose 120 pounds and become an Iron Man after beating a brain tumor. Don't believe you have to be like anybody to be somebody. If you're born a refugee, don't let it stop you from playing soccer for the national team at age 16. Don't become the best basketball player on the planet. Be bigger than basketball. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. When they talk about the greatest team in the history of the sport, make sure it's your team. If you have only one hand, don't just watch football. Play it at the highest level. And if you're a girl from Compton, don't just become a tennis player. Become the greatest athlete ever. Yeah, that's more like it. So don't ask if your dreams are crazy. Ask if they're crazy enough. So that was the ad that got them in so much trouble. Um, after I see it, I just want to go for a run or something. It's so inspirational. <laughs> um, but definitely doing corporate social activism has its risks. I, I don't know, again, if this was something that was big here, but Dove got in a lot of trouble because of this one ad that they made, um, which sort of appeared to show a black woman turning into a white woman. And this obviously sparked flashbacks to skin whitening and the notion that white equals beauty. And I think it's just a good example that shows that if companies are going to engage in this type of storytelling and activism, it's really important to know who's in the room and what voices are in the room and make sure there's a check on the narratives and the storytelling that they're, they're putting out there in the imagery. So this is perhaps one of my favorite examples of storytelling today, although it's, it's a little controversial, um, using storytelling techniques and tools in news and journalism. And I think a lot of organizations are actually doing a really amazing job at doing this because they are in such a difficult industry now where the way they make money essentially is getting eyeballs on their content. And the best way to get people to look at your content is by using storytelling, using narrative, using ways to get people to, to catch their attention essentially. Um, and one of the organizations that I absolutely adore is called Vox. I don't know if you've heard of it here. Um, they only started just a few years ago, I think in 2016. But they're essentially an organization that creates explainers. So they break down really, really difficult topics and they try to break them down through video, through images, um, through really well-written articles. And they actually created this great video that basically sums up every single year. And they created one that sums up um, 20, what year are we in, 2019? So yeah, the, they created one that sums up 2018. And I'm just going to show you that video because I really like how they did it. Laurel. Despite the chaos and confusion in our world, I see winds of hope blowing around the globe. It is a historic meeting. Kim Jong-un has become the first North Korean leader to visit the South 
since the Korean War. Families split either side of the Ethiopian Eritrean border, finally able to speak to each other for the first time in decades. Far-right candidate Zayed Bolsonaro has won Brazil's presidential race. Jacob Zuma will step down as South Africa's president. Does this house want to deliver Brexit? <laughs> the Irish people have voted in favor of scrapping a constitutional ban on abortion. This is about women taking their rightful place in Irish society, finally. A Chinese researcher claims to have helped make the world's first births of genetically altered humans. It's very disturbing. It's inappropriate. A data analysis firm linked to the Trump campaign retained the personal information of more than 50 million users. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. Seventeen people killed in, connection with in a, a mass, mass shooting, shooting at a Florida high synagogue in Pittsburgh. The gunman, the gunman opened fire, fire during morning. And I don't want prayers. I don't want thoughts. I want gun control, and I hope to God nobody else sends me any more prayers. Thousands of students are expected to walk out of their schools, a mass protest across the nation against gun violence. A new report by the UN carries a stark warning. Millions more people will die from extreme heat by the year 2040. India's Kerala state was hit by the worst flooding it's seen in a century. A powerful 7.5 magnitude earthquake struck the island of Sulawesi Friday. Several separate enormous wildfires are taking a terrible toll. The stuff that we lost isn't as important as the fact that our families all torn apart. Yemen's humanitarian crisis is escalating to devastating levels. The United Nations warns up to 13 million civilians are at risk of starvation. The administration's new crackdown on illegal immigration at the border. Over a six-week period, nearly 2,000 kids were separated from nearly as many adults. You know, they have a word. It sort of became old-fashioned. It's called a nationalist. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? In Paris, violent clashes erupted between police and protesters for the third straight weekend. We pay so many taxes. It's impossible now to have a, a good life for us. This is Jamal Khashoggi captured on closed circuit cameras, stepping into what Turkish authorities believe was a death trap. I am here today not because I want to be. I am terrified. Look at me when I'm talking to you. You're telling me that my assault doesn't matter. That what happened to me doesn't matter. That Bill Cosby becomes the, the first, first celebrity to be convicted in the Me Too era. I've dreamt of this day for 32 years. Abusers, your time is up. The survivors are here standing tall and we are not going anywhere Falling on your knees. what i know for sure is that speaking your truth is the most powerful tool we all have so i want all the girls watching here and now to know that a new day is on the horizon <laughs> Midterm elections were full of historic firsts. First Muslim women. First Native American women. First openly gay man elected governor. It means something to kids and people to see images that reflect themselves. It's historical. It moves me, like it moves me to tears. That is going to have an impact because imagery does, you know, representation does. Fronts are the champions of the world. All 12 boys and their soccer coach have now been rescued from that flooded cave in Thailand. An immigrant from Mali is being called a real-life Spider-Man after he rescued a child dangling from a balcony. Look at this. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. There are no limits to the human spirit. Touchdown confirmed. I believe what makes us unique is transcending our limits. I would much rather fail gloriously than not venture, not try. It's hard to believe that much happened in one year. <laughs> and that's not even everything. So I really enjoy Vox's um, use of really amazing editing, really good uh, music and just very simple graphics in their videos, which you kind of saw an example there to sort of retell what everything that happened last year. Um, and all of their videos are sort of like that. So I've shown a couple here where they have a, a um, 
a series on Netflix called Explained, where they talk about so many different things that they explain in like 15 to 18 minutes. In one episode, they even explained K-pop and why it's so popular. Um, so they're just a really good example that's sort of using storytelling to break down facts and provide really important context. But there are also a lot of organizations that use storytelling to, um, to push a certain narrative and to manip manipulate audiences to merely appeal to their emotions for ratings. And um, I think a lot of many big name political commentary shows do this while masquerading as hard news. And we have a lot of examples of this in the United States on the right and on the left. So you could say a lot of shows on Fox News do this, but a lot of shows on MSNBC also do this. I don't know if you have sort of the same issue in Spain in terms of political pundits going and sitting in a circle and just sort of yelling at each Oh, you do? OK, well, that's great. good to know, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> so this is an issue that I guess everywhere is really struggling with, is you need good storytelling in order to get the content to people, but you also don't want the narrative and the storytelling to take over facts and to take over hard news um, and to really bias what you're trying, the message and what you're trying to put out there. And it's also really eroding the trust in these institutions. Um, and for democracies, you know, journalism is really important. So I think that's a, a big worry for a lot of people. And finally, my last example is um, sort of what keeps me up at night is into that, which is about deep fakes and fake news. Um, deep fakes are essentially videos that can be made through software to make it look like something is happening or someone is saying something that they're not actually saying or they're not actually doing. And um, there was this really great article at the Brookings Institute, and part of the article said that deep fakes can scramble our understanding of truth in multiple ways. And as we become more attuned to the existence of deep fakes, they essentially will undermine our trust in all videos, including those that are actually genuine. And truth itself, therefore, becomes elusive. And because we can't really be sure any longer of what is real and what is not, we kind of lose our ability to be able to distinguish that for ourselves. So that's very, very terrifying to me. Um, and I actually really love that BuzzFeed did this really interesting PSA um, about fake news in April, I think it was 2017 or 2018, so I'm just going to quickly show that. And even within, you know, less than a year away from now, like 2017, what year are we in? 2019, sorry. So even two years ago, this version of a deep fake was actually pretty good, so I can only imagine how much better it's going to get. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward in the age of information is going to be the difference between whether we survive or whether we become some kind of fucked up dystopia. Thank you, and stay woke, bitches. So that was actually pretty good. <laughs> Some people that initially saw that video thought he was actually saying those things. So that's not that long ago. So like I said, it's very terrifying to know how far we can actually get with deepfakes and how difficult it's going to become to distinguish these types of videos for ourselves. And um, when I was doing sort of research on this topic, I came across this really interesting article on how stuff works. Again, one of my favorite institutions. And the article said that computer-generated videos have actually been an integral part of feature film movies for over 30 years. So virtually every high-end movie production contains a significant percentage of CGI, so computer-generated imagery. So from video, um, movies like Lord of the Rings to movies that are out now, like Marvel, um, Avengers Endgame. And these results are hard to distinguish from reality, and it often goes unnoticed that this content is not real. So we've actually already become very accustomed to watching videos that have a lot of fake content and CGI that we don't really care that it's fake and we can't really notice that it's fake. 
So essentially the point here is that how easily this can actually become very normalized in society and therefore how do we move forward knowing that all these fake videos are actually out there. So those are just a few examples of the uses and abuses of storytelling and what I really want you to walk away with today is some steps on ways that I've sort of realized myself and have seen in the research to tell stories responsibly, which I believe is very crucial specifically for advocating for diversity and inclusion um, in this space when it's really important that we have people's trust and that we're telling people things that are based on fact and based on research. So the first is um, draw from truth. I think this is a pretty obvious one, that we want to have integrity when we're telling stories and we want to make sure that we're drawing from truth. The second is um, understand your positionality and checking your narrative. So positionality is actually um, a term that comes from feminist literature and it's essentially the social and political context that creates your identity. So like your race, your ethnicity, your social class, your sexual orientation. And it's really important to be aware of how your identity influences and potentially biases your understanding of and your outlook on the world. So when you're telling a story, it's really, really important to be checking your narrative and understanding your positionality. The third is to aim to change behavior, not necessarily attitudes. It's we know from a lot of behavioral science that it's so difficult to change people's attitudes and their beliefs, but it's actually, I don't want to say fairly easy, but it's easier to change people's behavior, and that's what we really want to get to at this point, is to change the way people act and the way that they behave. And then the fourth one is to provoke empathy. Um, I think a lot of us aim to provoke empathy and emotion in our storytelling. But if we're doing that, we want to give viewers a responsible action to take. We don't want to just be provoking their emotion, provoking their empathy, but giving them nowhere to put it. Um, especially in this space, we want to give people solutions and things that they can do to make the world a better place, obviously. Um, the fifth one, and this is obviously something I really try hard not to avoid, is that the narrative um, should frame, oh, sorry. The narrative shouldn't frame the data. It's, wait, did I write this right? Yeah, the narrative should frame the data, not the other way around. So you don't want the narrative to essentially inform the data. You want the data to inform your narrative. So if you're working with a lot of data and facts, you should be looking at the data first, not just pulling data to fit what it is you want to say. The data should be informing and really framing what you want to say. The sixth one is to value your audience and engage with them. Your audience is really the the people who can debate with you and tell you what you're doing wrong and what you're doing right. So you want to make sure when you're doing storytelling that it's, it's an exchange, that I'm talking to you and you're talking to me. And then finally, um, I did want to show a, what I think is a really great example of storytelling in this space. And this was actually a short film that was done by Pixar. I have you heard of it here? It's called Pearl. Um, and I think it does a really good job because the director, Kristen Leister, um, wrote this amazing story that focuses on this ball of yarn named Pearl who gets employed in a human dominant co company which causes her to be ignored by her fellow um, employees. And I love it because it alludes to a lot of things that we talk about in the space which is gender inequality, um, racial discrimination, sex segregation, and other issues that we're facing. And it also engaged the public really, really well and, they, and the director actually came out and had a very good dialogue with different people, especially on Twitter, which seems like a lot of debates happen nowadays. Um, so I wanted to show just a short of this because I really, really like this example. What's up, Jim tonight? <laughs> Welcome to BRO Capital. Uh, yeah, so you'll be up on the fourth floor with investments and, uh, what? The Tigers are up by 20? Yes! Uh, anyway, it's entry level, but your resume was by far the strongest. I'm sure you'll fit right in. Thanks! I still think it's unbelievable that I'm really here! Unbelievable. <clears throat> I, I mean, unbelievable. I'm so excited! I have a really good feeling about this! <laughs> Glad 
Good morning. I won't show too much more because I'm running out of time, but I think if you haven't seen it, you should definitely watch it because um, it just displays so many things that we talk about this in this space so very, very well. And finally, I want to leave you with a quote that um, maybe I can try to get the Spanish translation of this, but please write it down, take a photo, tattoo it on your arm, do whatever you have to do to remember it because I think it's really important that we um, understand this notion when we're doing as storytellers. And it's by Erin Morgenstern, who wrote a book called The Night Circus. And she said, you may tell a tale that takes up residence in someone's soul, becomes their blood and self and purpose. That tale will move them and drive them, and who knows what they might do because of it, because of your words. That is your role. That is your gift. And for many of us, storytelling is our gift. And we work in storytelling, or we do storytelling as part of our job. And therefore, we need to be really responsible with the way that we tell stories, because we never know how people are going to take what we're putting out there and what they're going to do based on that information or based on that emotion that we evoke or based on that imagery. So I think it's really important to remember this, that we, we want to be responsible from the very beginning and when we're telling these different types of stories. So thank you so much for your attention. If you, um, thank you.